All right, so let's talk about the heat diffusion equation. So this is a type of analysis that you see, see multiple times in your mechanical engineering education. You should have seen it in applied strengths. You'll see it, you should see it when you're doing uh, the differential analysis in fluid mechanics. So sometimes we skip that and you're seeing it here in, in uh, heat transfer. So the way it starts is we assume that we have out of this wall where the heat is moving in this direction, we pull out a small little differential volume and it's a differential volume in Cartesian coordinates, so the volume is given by dx, by dy, by dz. And if we're going to assume only heat transfer in the x direction, we will state that the heat is going to go from some x value to another x value, and it'll be passing through an area of magnitude dy times dz. Now remember, all of these terms are constants the way we're, we're we're utilizing them right now. All right, so this is the simplification of my cube. I have the left-hand side is at some coordinate x, the right-hand side is at some coordinate x plus dx. On the left-hand side, we're going to say that we have energy moving in to the differential volume. On the right-hand side, at a dx away from it, we have energy moving out of the control volume. And then the two terms here are ones that we allow in the delta E or E dot ST is the stored energy. So we're going to allow for the case where energy can build up within this volume, i.e. its temperature can increase as a function of time or its temperature can decrease as a function of time. Same thing with this red E dot G. This is going to be internal energy generation. So we're going to allow for some type of mechanism that could allow, that could be a volumetric process where the energy, the volume itself at some point in time could be steady, it could be unsteady, would be generating some amount of thermal energy. All right, so just recreating my picture over here. So in green is the rate at which energy passes into the element. In blue is the rate at which energy passes out of the element. I just want to talk about the left-hand side of the equation for right now. So if we have a certain, so what we're essentially saying here and what we have in the back is that this is Fourier's law and Fourier's law can be a function of X. So we can evaluate Fourier's law at X and we can evaluate Fourier's law at X plus DX. The red term is the rate at which ener energy is generated within the volume. So this is gonna be the term E dot gen, little e, and this is gonna be watts per cubic meter. Watts per cubic meter times the volume would give you watts. So, and the volume in this case is dx, dy, dz. Now the rate at which energy is stored within the element, well, we know that. We know the amount of energy in a volume. We gave it as m dot c sub p times its absolute temperature. So in this case, we're just gonna say, well, how how would that total amount of energy change as a function of time if we're allowing the part of the element to heat up or cool down? So in this case, we'll let M be represented by rho, the density of the material. So we're going to assume a constant density of material times the volume times C sub P times, now we have this derivative, dt dx, a time derivative. And notice we're and going to end up, when we rearrange, we end up with a dx dy dz and the rate that energy is generated with the element is also a function of dx, dy, dz. So now let's come up to this thing I skipped. What you're gonna see in a lot of texts, actually it's not specifically stated in the text we're using right now, uh, but they'll, they, the writers of the textbook, would say that they would have this term and then they'll write it like this and they'll say something about using a one-term Taylor series expansion, we can allow this to be equal to that. And sometimes that is very unsatisfying, especially for an undergraduate. So I would like to take a second to take a look at what's going on here. All right, so what we're basically saying here is that if I know the value, if I, if I know the function and I know the value at a set location, say right here, x equaling 80, and I wanna know what the value of the function is over here at some 80 plus some delta x, I can either figure it out explicitly or I can use this approximation, this one term, this one term Taylor, Taylor series expansion. All right, so let's assume right now 
the point is, is that we don't know what this function is. That's why we're using the Taylor series expansion. But what we're going to do here is just prove that this thing works. So if I have this function and I evaluate it at 80, right, so 240. And then if I say I want to evaluate it at x plus dx, I'll let dx be 5. So we would evaluate it at 85 and we get 207.5. All right. Now, this term over here, right, would be 240. What do we have with this term? Well, I would going to take the derivative of this function, and that's going to be 10 minus 0.2x, and I'm going to evaluate it at x equaling, uh, x equaling 80. So at x equaling 80, we end up with this term being minus 6. And then we're going to say that this term, right, I've already evaluated at f e at f, the, <laughs> the value of the function at x equaling 85 is 207.5. But the approximation is start with the value of the function at 80, which is 240, and then add to that the value of the derivative evaluated at 80, which is minus 6, and multiply that term by this delta x that you're interested in, in this case is 5. So we get to 210. So for a delta x of 5, we're okay. We're in the ballpark, but we're not exactly where we'd want to be. All right? So we'd say, all right, well, let's repeat this for a smaller delta x, right? Because we're not using delta x over here. We're using dx, a differential. So we repeat for delta x equaling 1. So f at 81, or so just remember what we're doing. We know the value at 80 is 240. The value at f plus delta x is 81, so that evaluates to 233.9. So again, if I use the Taylor series approximation, the value at 80 is 240. The value of this derivative doesn't change, right? That's the point, so this stays minus six. Now multiplying it by five, or not five, by the, our new delta x, which is one, we get to 234. So you can see that these are very close. And of course, we could repeat this for 0 0.1, 0 0.01, et cetera, and that would give us a better and better value. So by using the one-term Taylor series expansion, we are able to convert this value, this, this term, into something that we can work with. And what do we mean by something we can work with? Well, let's go back and take a look at where we're headed with the heat diffusion equation. So we're applying the first law, so E dot in minus E dot out, plus the energy generated within the element, within the, the volume, will have to equal the rate of change of energy within the element. So we use our colors. So E dot in is Q dot X minus Q dot X plus DX, plus the energy generation term. And all of this is going to equal the rate of change of energy in the element. All right, so if we apply the Taylor series expansion to this term, which we've already done, we will get this, right? So now remember, it's a negative sign. So these two terms become negative. And well, once we do that, these terms cancel, cancel out, all right? So now let me point out to you what we're trying to do before we go any further, right? We're look, the heat diffusion equation is going to be a differential equation in terms of T, right? So we have the temperature on the right-hand side as a function of time, but you see over on the left-hand side, temperature doesn't show up anywhere. So that's what we're working towards right now. So we have minus dq dx times dx, but what is dq dx? Well, that's Fourier's law. I can utilize or I can, I can um, take this derivative and q dot is Fourier's law. So I can take the spatial derivative of Fourier's law and if I substitute Fourier's law in, now, now we're cooking with gas. Here's our temperature term. So what we're going to get is we can take this first spatial derivative of Fourier's law. Now, in this case, K is a constant. We're not, we're not allowing for variable specific heat. And remember, dy and dz, they're just differential sides of this cube, which are constants in this case. So they come out of my derivative, and I'll end up with dt, d, you know, the second derivative of t with respect to x. Now notice this is, we're writing this as a partial derivative, 
because we know that the temperature can also be a function of time. All right, so now we're going to plug this term back in. There's a negative sign here, so the negative times the negative is going to make this term positive. And there's the dx term here, which is going to give this a dx dy dz, just like the other terms. So this is what we end up with. So the applying the first law to the differential element, where we I'll use the Taylor series expansion to give us a value or to evaluate the rate of energy leaving the volume and using that and then applying Fourier's law to it, we come up to this expression. Now, of course, we can uh, cancel out the volume term across all three of the terms and we end up with this differential equation. So I have this repeated on the next page, so let's take a look at it. So what is this? Well, this is a second order spatial, right? So the second derivative with respect to x, so that's a second order in the spatial term and first order in the temporal term. So we got a couple things going on here. So it's second order spatial, first order temporal, linear partial differential equation. And if we can solve this, the solution will be in the form of a temperature field that gives us the temperature at any x location at any given time. All right, so just to clean it up, we're going to, the textbook is a nice explanation of thermal diffusivity. So this was what's typically used when we write out the heat diffusion equation. So the thermal diffusivity is the inverse of this term here. So this becomes our final version of the heat diffusion equation the one-dimensional form so the and it's the one-dimensional cartesian form we're also going to have a one-dimensional cylindrical form and a one-dimension spherical form all right but i've just gone through the nuts and bolts of of developing the one-dimensional cartesian form of the heat diffusion equation